In this video, we are doing a deep dive into the world of onions, one of the most used ingredients around the world. However, even though we use onions all the time in our cooking, it's an ingredient that is underappreciated and one that most of us home cooks know very little about from a fundamental level. For example, why do we enjoy the flavor of onions? Can you actually taste the difference between red, white, yellow, or sweet onions? And how does the flavor change when onions are used raw, cooked, or caramelized? Do shallots taste different than onions? Or should certain onions be avoided for specific cuisines? Stop using yellow onions in your Mexican food. So over the past several weeks, I ran through a bunch of different tests with a variety of onions. This includes eating them raw, like an apple, testing yellow versus white onion in a pico de gallo, sauteing all five varieties, using shallots for a chopped cheese, and caramelizing onions on a spectrum to see how the flavor changes. And I promise this video will completely change how you think about onions. For example, you may be interested to know that sweet onions do not contain more sugar than a yellow or white onion. Based on USDA nutrition data, on a 100 gram basis, they actually have slightly less. Now compare that to a sweet potato, which literally does have 3.5% more sugar than a russet potato. So why are sweet onions called sweet? We'll find out shortly. I also found out that it might be possible to caramelize onions in just 10 minutes. This is not Onions 101 or 201. By the end of this video, all of us will have our masters in onions for home cooks. Now, in order to cook all of these onions, the main pan I used was the 10 inch carbon steel season pan from today's sponsor, Made In. Later in the video, I challenged myself to see if it's possible to caramelize onions in just 10 minutes. And the carbon steel pan is the perfect choice for this because it heats really quickly and evenly to give you plenty of temperature control. Carbon steel is way lighter than cast iron and is compatible on gas, electric, and induction stovetops. Plus, this version has been pre-seasoned with a mixture of shea nut oil and coconut oil, meaning they've taken care of the first two seasonings, which if you've ever tried to do it yourself, it can be a little tricky to get that naturally nonstick surface. If you want to check out Made In's Carbon Steel Collection, head to the link in my description to save on your order. This pan will be getting plenty of use as we navigate the world of onions. So let's unpack the different varieties of onions and pull out the key takeaways that you need to know when it comes to using onions raw, sauteed, and caramelized. And where do we start? Well, of course, in the ground. Onions are part of the genus Allium, which is a group of plants in the lily family that have a central stem bud and leaf-based system that will sprout green tops above the ground and sometimes a bulb below the ground. There are over 500 species of alliums around the world, but only a dozen or two are commonly cultivated for eating and cooking purposes. Of which, alliums are known for their strong sulfury aromas, which are used to deter animals from eating them raw. Whoa! <laughs> that deterrent still works today. However, when most alliums are cooked, they are transformed into a savory quality that adds a depth of complexity to dishes in just about every cuisine around the world. Alliums can be either bulbing or non-bulbing. Common non-bulbing alliums include scallions, chives, leeks, ramps, or Chinese garlic chives. And in these cases, since there is no bulb, we eat the above ground leaves. These alliums will have similar flavor characteristics, but for purposes of this video, we are focusing on bulbing alliums, and specifically the species Allium sapa. This species includes common bulbing onions such as white, yellow, red, sweet, shallots, and spring onion varieties. And what I wanna figure out is, do these varieties actually taste that different in a variety of dishes? But first, I know there is a burning question you probably have, why do onions have layers? Layers! Onions have layers. According to onionusa.org, onions may be one of the earliest cultivated crops because they were less perishable than other foods at the time, were transportable, easy to grow, and could be grown in a variety of soils and climates. And what's unique about balmy onions is that they are biennial plants, meaning they have a two-year life cycle. In the first year, they start from the seeds produced by the flower of a mature onion, which will grow green tops above the ground and start to grow a small ball below the ground, about the size of a nickel or quarter, depending on the variety. After the first season, the green tops die off, but that tiny bulb can remain underground or be harvested and then planted next year. 
And if you are growing your own onions at home, many people start with onion sets, which are basically these tiny one season old onions. Now I need some help here. If anyone is an onion farmer or just knows the answer to this question, let me know in the comments below. So pearl onions, cipollini, or baby onions can sometimes be found and bought at the store. However, this got me wondering, are these A, onion sets that have been grown for a single season and sold for consumption instead of planting the second season? B, are they onion sets that were planted in the second season and then harvested early before they reach full size? Or C, are these a mature onion variety that after the two growing seasons happen to grow very small bulbs? And yeah, I couldn't find a specific answer for this, so fill in the blank for us below. Anyway, in the second year, the onion plant used the store energy in the bulb to sprout up again to produce those green tops. And these leaf layers are what turn into the thick fleshy layers of the onions in the bulb below the ground. And remember this for later, most of the aroma in the onion comes from the sulfur that is found in the soil where they grow. So in the second season, when the green tops start to wither or the plant has started to flower, it signifies that the plant has completed growing its bulb underground and is ready to be harvested, where they will then be prepared for storage and market. And as we covered in the garlic video, onions too are cured for long-term storage before you get them at the grocery store. The excess soil is brushed off the harvested bulbs, which are then strung up to hang in a dry, well-ventilated area for about two to four weeks. During this time, the outer layers of the onions dry, forming that protective papery skin that allows them to be held in long-term dry storage, which is why onions are available year-round. And today, world onion production is estimated at 105 billion pounds each year, where the average person consumes 13 pounds of onions across the world, and Libya, interestingly, has the highest consumption of onions with an astounding average per capita consumption of 66 0.8 pounds of onions. So now that we know in general how onions are grown, let me introduce you to the varieties that we will be using for testing throughout this video. First is the yellow onion, and this is the most commonly used onion in the United States as it represents about 87% of the total onion production. However, included in that 87% is candidate number two, sweet onion. So sweet onions, Vidalia, and Walla Walla onions are all varieties of yellow onions that are said to be sweet and milder tasting than the regular yellow onion counterpart. And in order to be called a Vidalia onion, by law, it actually has to be from the state of Georgia. I'm using a generic sweet onion for testing today. Now, people call them sweet, but is it actually true where you can tell a difference? We'll find out shortly. It's very like crunchy, crisp, and juicy. Candidate number three is one of my personal favorites, the red onion. And this is roughly estimated around 8% of total US onion production, and it's the common onion used in Indian cuisine. Additionally, the red onion gives you the beautiful vibrant color of pickled onions. The fourth candidate is the white onion, which represents about 5% of total onion production in the United States, and this is typically the onion of choice for Mexican cuisine. Does it actually make better Mexican food like Rick Bayless says? We'll see. Lastly, we have the shallot. Now, up until 2010, the shallot was actually considered a different species, but it is now included in Allium sepa. What's weird about shallots, though, is that they're almost a cross between garlic and a bulbing onion. They look like an onion with its layers when you slice into them, except they also create cloves like garlic does. Sometimes when you buy a shallot, you'll get two cloves that can be broken apart and sliced separately. And lobing alliums tend to have a higher carb and lower water content, which as I found out, can lead to pretty different flavors and properties when used in cooking. This one to me, I think is so much better. The balance between the onioniness and the beefiness is amazing. So the question that we need to answer is how different do these onions actually taste? And what seems like a simple question is actually quite complex due to two reasons. Reason number one, the same onion can taste completely different depending on how it's used. For example, when bitten raw, they can be completely overwhelming. However, if you add a little lime juice and mix raw onions with tomatoes, cilantro, and pepper, they become everyone's favorite pico de gallo. When onions are sauteed, they completely lose that pungent bite and instead develop a beautiful savory aroma that we all love. Or if you cook them even further and caramelize them, they transform to develop a deep sweetness. 
So because of this, I decided to do eight different tests spanning a variety of use cases three raw ones, three sauteed ones, and two caramelized ones in order to give us the full picture when it comes to using onions. And the first test that I decided to do was eating each onion raw straight up like an apple. However, before we jumped into what I learned, reason number two on why it's so hard to explain the differences between the onions is that everyone discusses them differently. People will say that white onions have a cleaner or milder flavor than yellow onions, or Vidalia onions are sweeter than normal onions, but the problem is, I have no idea what a cleaner onion flavor even means, or like I mentioned in the intro, sweet onions do not have more sugar content like a lot of people think they do. So before we try to say, are white onions better for Mexican food, or are red onions better for Indian food, we need to define some terms and answer this question. What is the flavor of onions? At a high level, these six properties make up the flavor of food. Taste, aroma, texture, sight, physical, and the human element. And if you want to read more information about these, these are the flavor properties that we use on my website, Cookwell, that you'll see tagged in the recipes. This will help you understand what an ingredient is providing in terms of flavor. Now, when it comes to onions, these six properties become more or less important, again, depending on how they are used. So let's start with the flavor of raw onion, then we'll progress to sauteed and caramelized. And for this first test, I took a bite from each onion like an apple and came away with three big observations. First, the white, yellow, and sweet onion were much more similar to each other than I thought. Secondly, the red onion had the most oniony aroma. And third, the shallot was by far the most pungent and caused me the most painful physical reaction. Whoa. <laughs> so what do these actually mean? Well, let's walk through the flavor properties. Remember, there are just five main tastes, sweet, salty, sour, bitter, and umami. And in their raw form, onions are actually pretty neutral tasting. And here's a weird test that you can do at home to showcase this concept. Get out a slice of apple and a layer of yellow onion, plug your nose, and take a bite. Texturally, you will feel a difference, yes, but with your nose closed, you may be surprised to find that they aren't as different as you would expect. Why? Well, onions, just like apples, are made up of three main molecules, water, carbohydrates, and protein. Apples are around 85% water, 14.7% carbohydrates, of which about 12% are total sugars, and 0.1% protein. Yellow onions, on the other hand, are around 90% water, 8.6% carbohydrates, and about 6% of that is total sugars, and lastly, 0.83% of protein. Now, you may be going, Ethan, why are we talking about molecules here? Well, let me explain. As we know, water doesn't really smell or taste like anything, so that means most of the flavor of an onion is coming from the protein and carbohydrate makeup. And hopefully you can see where we're going. Each of our onion candidates have a unique combination of water, carbohydrates, and protein. And you can pause here if you want to take a look, but two things that I would point out are, look how similar the yellow, white, and sweet onion are. Red onion starts to dip a little bit in terms of water, and then the shallot is all the way down at 80%. Now keep this in mind throughout the video because this has implications in the flavor of their raw form, but also in their cooked forms. For example, caramelized onions are a mixture of the Maillard reaction, which needs protein molecules to happen, and the caramelization reaction, which only happens with sugar molecules. Now back to our weird apple test. This is also why, with your nose closed, you may be able to detect the slightly sweeter taste in the apple, but it's not as obvious as you would think. However, as soon as you open up your nose, there is no mistaking which one is the onion and which one is the apple. Look, it's a pretty weird test, but it really goes to show why smell is so important when it comes to identifying the differences in the food we eat. Most of the unique flavors we experience in food are actually from the aroma or smell. Remember, an ingredient can really only have the five main tastes, but can potentially have hundreds of unique aroma molecules, as we've learned in the vanilla and garlic videos. And this also holds true for onions. The main reason that we use onions in cooking is to release their signature aromas, which is one of the key differentiators in these various types of onion. The idea is that different species of Allium sapa will produce different sulfur compounds. So when we get into the testing here, the primary question that we are really asking is, do these onions smell different? 
And as I found out, in some cases, yes, they do. And in other cases, I couldn't tell a difference at all. I would say the shallot and the red onion are by far the most aromatic and most different from these other ones. The shallot has this nice like top note that is very interesting. And then the red onion for me has this kind of dominantly onion smell to it. The sweet onion on the other hand, I think this is the least aromatic. And then the white onion and the yellow onion I think are fairly similar. I'm having a little bit of a tough time differentiating these. So let's answer the question, what do onions smell like? This is a picture of onion cells. And like most alliums, these cells are loaded with sulfur containing compounds that will give an onion its signature aroma. But if you smell a whole onion, it doesn't smell like anything. However, when the onion cells are damaged through biting, slicing, or chopping, chemical reactions begin to occur and it creates the sulfurous odor and pungent bite, which you may wonder, how exactly does this work? Well, as noted in the investigation of volatiles emitted from freshly cut onions, upon rupture of the cell wall, the alanase enzyme is mixed with the aroma precursors, which are the cysteine sulfoxides. And the products of the enzymatic reaction between alanase and these cysteine sulfoxides are pyruvate, ammonia, and various sulfenic acids, depending on the substituents present in these cysteine sulfoxide. Additionally, in onion, the major sulfoxide is propanol cysteine sulfoxide, which is primarily transformed into the onion lacrimatory factor, or LF synthase. And LF synthase seems to be present immediately after cutting, but it almost completely disappears after about 30 minutes. So as a home cook, you don't need to remember any of those specific terms and definitions, but here are the three takeaways in layman's terms that you do need to know. Takeaway number one, different onion varieties can have a unique aroma depending on their combination of volatile organic compounds that are released. And in this first raw test, I was surprised to find that the white, yellow, and sweet onions smelled quite similar to me. It was the red onion that definitely had the strongest onion aroma, and the shallot had a very unique top note aroma that wasn't present in the other four. And we are about to do a variety of tests to see where this matters and where it doesn't. Takeaway number two is that you can increase or decrease the intensity of onion flavor depending on how many cells are damaged. Here is one quarter of an onion whole, sliced, diced, minced, and ground into a paste. And in this case, the ground onion will have released more aromatic compounds because more cells have been damaged. And I've tested this with diced onions versus a Michelin star minced onion, and it's really surprising how much more onion flavor comes through in the rice where more onion cells were damaged. Takeaway number three, onion aroma molecules are volatile and reactive, so they will change over time when exposed to air, heat, light, water, and fat. For example, the lacrimator in freshly cut onions is released as a volatile gas that touches the moisture on our eyes, which we do not like, so it causes us to cry. But as noted in the investigation, that lacrimator will be in varying amounts and after 30 minutes, it completely disappears. And this is why onions do not continue to make us cry after chopping. And as noted in the investigation, the plot chart showed that the volatile organic compounds changed fast during the initial 10 minutes after cutting the onions. It changed some after 10 to 60 minutes and changed less towards the total of the sampling period. And this is why I felt like we had to do a variety of tests before drawing any conclusions on which onions may be the best for certain occasions. Okay, so aroma was the big one when it comes to the flavor of an onion, but before we get to testing, let me speed run through physical flavor, sight, texture, and the human element. Physical flavor is a reminder that ingredients can affect the physical senses of the human body. For example, spicy food is not a taste, but a reaction in our body, and raw onions can cause two physical reactions. First are those reactive tears from the lacrimators that irritate our eyes, and secondly is a pungent sting in our mouth and nasal passages. And pungency is neither a taste nor a smell, but a general feeling of irritation that verges on pain. As we learned in the garlic video, garlic produces a hundredfold higher concentration of those pungent sulfurous molecules. And these molecules attach to our sensitive mouth and nose linings, which will cause that mild, uncomfortable sensation that can really wake up our culinary senses. In general, raw garlic is more pungent than milder alliums like chives, leeks, and onions. However, in this first test, I was surprised to find that the shallot by far had the most pungency and caused the most irritation to my mouth and nasal passage. 
This was followed by the red onion, which easily caused me some coughing and stinging as well. However, the other three onions were much, much milder. I would say the sweet onion had the lowest pungency, but the white and yellow were barely more. So it'll be interesting to see how these flavor change when we start cooking with the onions. From a sight perspective, this is a reminder that we eat with our eyes and can actually be influenced by presentation, color, and visual cues in our food. And onion species have different colors when they are raw, but can also change color when they are cooked. For example, red onions have that beautiful, vibrant pinkish red, so they will contrast with a lot of foods, whereas a finely diced white onion sauteed for risotto will basically disappear. And when we cook, we make choices with our onions depending on site. I mean, even if these white onions had a better aroma when they are pickled, I would still make pickled onions with red onions just for the beautiful contrasting color. Next, we have texture, and in the raw form, all of these onion varieties have roughly the same texture. What matters more is how you change the texture of the onion you're using in your cooking. If used raw, there's going to be a slight crunch, but this can be done with slices, a medium dice, or if you use a really fine mince, you probably won't notice a crunch at all. On the other side of the spectrum, when we caramelize sliced onions, they can become completely soft and almost jammy. And lastly, we have the human element. And this is a reminder that we experience food not just with our physical senses, but through our emotions, nostalgia, and cultural associations. And when it comes to onion varieties, one of the biggest biases at play is its cultural associations. Certain cuisines will predominantly use certain types of alliums and onions in their cooking. Red onions seem to be the onion of choice for Indian cuisine. Shallots are the alium of choice in most fresh curry paste in Thai cuisine. Yellow onion is the typical choice for French mirepoix and Italian sofrito. And white onions are used for a lot of Mexican dishes. And my question is, are we being influenced by our human biases? How different do they actually taste if I use red onion for a Mexican dish or white onion for a dish from Indian cuisine? Well, now that we have all the context needed for flavor, it's time for testing. And after doing the raw bite test, the first question that I started to wonder was, can you actually tell the difference in aroma between a white onion and a yellow onion in a pico de gallo? Okay, so I've got four bowls of pico, two have the white onion, two have the yellow onion. We're gonna blindfold up and do a triangle test to see if I can tell which ones are the same and which ones are different. For this test, I made two identical batches of pico de gallo with 120 grams of tomato, five grams of serrano pepper, 14 grams of cilantro, 30 grams of diced onion, 10 grams of lime juice, and one gram of salt. I diced the onions right at the same time and mixed them up before letting both salsas sit for 10 minutes to ensure the onion aromas are evened out before tasting. One, two, three. A little sniff test. I feel like most of the aroma that I'm getting is actually from the cilantro and the lime juice. But let's go for uh, number one here. Good pico. Nice spicy. I'd say the onion is just like a nice supporting character, not too dominant. You get the sourness from the lime juice. You get the tomato, the juiciness. A little salt brings up all those flavors. Really good first one. This is gonna be hard. I'm not sure how different those really were. Let's go to number three. It's really tough to tell a difference here. Remember, the onion is kind of a supporting character here and everything's mixed together. So I'm gonna go for a plain spoonful. There was one bite that I got from the middle one that I felt like was more onion forward, but maybe that was just because there were more onion pieces in that specific bite. All these bowls taste really, really good. I don't think there is really much, if at all, any difference. If I did have to guess based off one bite, I think two was a little bit more oniony in one of the bites that I took, which might just be because there happened to be more onion pieces in that single bite. So I'm gonna say one and three are the same and two is different, but I don't think this is really conclusive at all. No. So is this result surprising? To me, it wasn't. I would argue that all of these decisions are gonna have a much bigger impact on your pico than just a yellow versus a white onion. 
This includes the ripeness of your tomatoes, the ratio of tomato to onion to pepper, the amount of cilantro, which also provides a ton of aroma, and lastly, the amount of lime juice and salt added. Lime juice will interact with the allicin and sulfur compounds to less that pungent bite, and the salt enhances the flavor of every ingredient in the salsas. And if you want some follow-up homework, I think a more interesting salsa test would be using red onion or shallot versus the white onion because I think it would be much easier to pick up on the difference in aroma. Now, I can't possibly A-B test all five dishes multiple times or else we're going to be here for days. So I want to move to the sandwich test where I wanted to see if I could tell a difference between a red onion and a sweet one. So I've got the Italian hoagies ready, two with the red onion, which were the most potent in my first test, and then two with the sweet onion, which were the least pungent in the first test as well. So let's see if I could actually blindfold up and taste the difference. Now in this test, we are using raw onion in a pretty different way. In the prior test, we damaged plenty of onion cells by dicing them up, but those aroma molecules were mixed in with the water and aroma from the other ingredients. So it was pretty hard to pick up on any differences in the raw onion. In this test, we have a couple of key differences. First, I'm using onion varieties that to me smell significantly different. Secondly, the onion slices are not mixed with other ingredients. They are just added to the top. And lastly, I will crush more onion cells when I chew the sandwich and onion slices with my teeth. So I made one big Italian hoagie by slathering mayo on some bread, then I added copa, mortadella, salami, and provolone before cutting it in half. Then I added lettuce, sliced tomato, and both sliced onions varieties along with a touch of olive oil and vinegar. I wrapped up both halves to compress the sandwich and let's see if I can taste a difference. All right, number one. This was also, I was trying to think, what am I really in the mood for that I can make an onion test with? This is what I landed on. So good. Such a good combination. Salami, capicola, mortadella. I feel like the onion flavor didn't really come through that strong, which may think that is the sweet onion, but we'll see in a sec. <laughs> Literally enjoying this test so much right now. Again, really good. I feel like I'm getting almost no onion aroma and pungency. Let's see what number three. Number three. Like, I feel like I got the top note of onion in that one. I'm gonna come back through one because I just really enjoy these, but we gotta, we gotta find the answer here. Yeah, and then I'm gonna jump to three. For me, I think one and two are the same. I'm getting the crunch of the onion, but I feel like I'm not really getting any onion aroma or pungency. However, when I bit in number three, I was definitely greeted by that onion first, but then it blends in nicely with all the other ingredients. So let's see if I'm actually correct here. Not correct. Again, this is so confusing. Like I felt like the third one was the more oniony one. When I bite an individual onion, yes, I can tell that that red onion is more pungent. Like I'm crushing all the cells in there. But again, in the context of the entire sandwich, if I'm trying to specifically pick out, is this red onion versus sweet onion? It's, it's too hard to tell because there's so much other goodness going on in this sandwich, right? So I totally thought it would be much easier to pick up on the aroma between the red onion and the sweet onion in this test. And you're probably thinking, if you couldn't tell raw, there's no way you can possibly tell in a cook test. But that wasn't the case. I feel like two is the red onion. The tests where I cooked the onions were actually much easier to tell a difference due to the introduction of a very important molecule, fat. However, before we jump into the next test, here are the important takeaways that you should ask yourself when choosing an onion for raw applications. First, is the color important? For pickled onions, you wanna go with red, or in a pico de gallo, the white onion contrasts a bit better with the tomato or if you are mixing it with cilantro. Secondly, do I want an intense sulfurous aroma or a milder one? For a more concentrated flavor, I'd try out a red onion or a shallot. For a milder one, I'd go with any of the other three. There's not likely gonna be a big difference. Lastly, do I want a pungent bite? If you do, remember the aromas change over time, but they're gonna be most intense right after the onion cells are damaged. 
So prepare onions right before serving and do not mix them with other ingredients if you want that little tingly pungent bite from the onion. Now, when we cook onions, this pungency goes away completely, and the way that we perceive the flavors starts to change quite a bit. So to start, I diced 50 grams of each onion variety, added 10 grams of neutral oil, then sauteed them for about 8 minutes before giving them a taste, and here's how cooking can change the flavor of onions. So I've got all five onion varieties sauteed up in a little bit of oil, so let's give them a taste and see how close or different these really are. First, let's talk about what happens with the aroma and why fat is so important. Fat works as a thermal conductor, and as it heats up the onion, it will help release those volatile organic compounds that we just talked about. Now, some of these are lost to the air, which is what we can smell as they waft throughout our kitchen, but additionally, aroma molecules can be fat-soluble, so they actually dissolve and carry the aroma molecules in the fat. This is why we can make scallion, garlic, or onion-flavored oils instead of scallion-flavored water. Additionally, because of fat's texture, it lingers in on our tongue and mouth, so our nasal passage is easily able to detect the onion aromas when they are sautéed in a fat. Simply put, in raw onions, the aromas are more fleeting, while the aromas in fat are trapped. So that's aroma. But like I said, from a physical perspective, the pungency is now completely gone. You can eat a spoonful of sautéed onions and have no irritation or coughing. Additionally, from a taste perspective, if you close your nose, you may be able to perceive a bit more sweet flavor from the natural sugars in the onion, mainly because that pungency is completely gone. In terms of texture, obviously the onions will soften as you cook them. From a sight perspective, they become slightly translucent. And obviously, our human biases still exist, where if you are used to a specific allium, you may be able to perceive the flavor better or worse than other people. So, how different do these onion varieties taste when they are now sautéed? I am going to shuffle these. I'm not trying to guess what, which is which. I am more so just trying to give observations between them. Then right after this, we'll get into some tasty triangle tests. Okay, number one. Pretty mellow onion flavor on that one, I would say. Noticeably different taste between one and two. Two much stronger, clean, oniony flavor, um, whereas one was really, really quite mild. Three. Another mild one, much, very, very close to number one. Number two, strongest, most oniony forward taste. Um, one and three are mild. I think three is sweeter than number one to me, but let's keep moving. Four to me feels the least aromatic of these so far, close to one and three, but less aromatic than one and three. Let's go to five. Yep, right off the bat, I would guess that's the shallot. You get that same top fragrant note that you get from the raw test, except without any of that pungency, so it's very, very enjoyable and pleasant compared to the raw one where I was kind of coughing and my eyes started watering immediately. But let's see what these are. So for me, very easy to tell the difference between red onion and shallot. These three, again, much closer. The only thing that I really picked up on was I thought this was a little bit sweeter. This has got me very interested to hop into the taste test. So let's do the refried bean triangle test and the chopped cheese triangle test. Now after tasting these, it seemed like a waste to do another white versus yellow or sweet onion, so I wanted to pit the red onion versus the white onion against each other. I have the refried bean samples, two with red onion, two with white onion. Let's blindfold up, take one away, and see if I can guess which one's which. For this test, I made two identical batches of refried beans by dicing each of the onion varieties and then adding them to some oil in a carbon steel pan. I sauteed each onion to trap those aroma molecules, then added the beans and some salt and simmered this for a few minutes until they thickened up. I feel like that one did have a nice onion flavor to it. Mm. Also good. Is that one more bean forward? I feel like less oniony, more bean forward. 
Uh, dude, these tests are always so hard. I feel like this is red onion. Three to me tastes more bean forward, like a, like maybe like a 90, 10, like beans with like a hint of onion. I'm gonna call an audible and taste the fourth one. I feel like two and three are for sure different. And I think two is the red onion. So I cheated, but I think two and this one that I pulled off are the red onion. And I think one and three are the same. Let's see. Yes, okay. I can tell that it's the red onion based off of that same like top aroma note. And the red onion in this, it's a more onion forward refried bean. The white onion gives it this very subtle hint of onion. Whereas the red onion in the same amount packs a lot more of that onion fragrance. I think you'd need to use almost double or maybe triple the amount of white onion to replicate what you're getting in this red onion. But very, very interesting test. But now let's move forward to a test that I've been looking forward to. We are going to make a shallot chopped cheese. Now, for test number two, instead of doing a basic risotto or some recipe that typically uses shallot, I wanted to use the shallot in a weird way. So since I love sandwiches, I landed on the shallot chopped cheese, and here's a spoiler. This one to me, I think is so much better. For this test, I made two identical chopped cheeses. I added 200 grams of 85-15 ground beef along with two grams of salt to the pan and let that cook down. Next, I added 30 grams of the shallot to one pan and 30 grams of sweet onion to the other, and I let those sweat down with the beef so everyone got to know each other. And one note here, as the beef browns, the Maillard reaction is occurring, which will also generate some new aromas. And remember this when we talk about caramelized onions in just a bit. After cooking the beef and onions, I added some American cheese to each pan and let that melt before loading it up into the roll. I added some mayo, the beef cheese onion mixture, and a bit of lettuce for fresh crunts before wrapping each of them up. So this is a little bit of a fun test before we get to caramelization. Shallot versus the onion chopped cheese. Let's blindfold up and see which one is better. Oh my gosh, so hungry. Mm. Mm. Pretty incredible. Mm. I don't know if I just got like a big bread bite, but I feel like that was like not as flavorful as the first one. Still amazing. I feel like this one is much more beef forward, less oniony, aroma-y kind of thing. This one to me, I think is so much better. I'm gonna guess that's the shallot. The balance between the onioniness and the beefiness is amazing in this one. Don't get me wrong, like this is still amazing too, but more beef forward. So let's see if I'm right. I think this is shallot, and I think this is the sweet onion. Yeah, shallot, sweet onion. Man, this is, this is a cool test, wow. You guys gotta try the shallot chopped cheese. That is insane. Okay, so even though I was able to tell a difference in these sauteed variations, you still need to ask yourself, how important is the choice of the onion in a dish? And as always, I would highly recommend trying out one of these tests for yourself. Do you prefer the strong aroma of the red onion? Because that's a completely personal choice. For example, if you've ever recreated a dish in Indian cuisine and used white or yellow onion and wondered why it didn't quite taste the same, it could be that the red onion is the missing ingredient and playing a significant role. Now, we know how to use raw onions, we understand how the flavor changes in sauteed onions, so lastly, let's talk about caramelized onions, which are basically unrecognizable in terms of flavor compared to the raw ones, and I could have made a whole separate video with all the questions that I have, such as, can you tell a difference between fresh and frozen onions that were caramelized? Do baking soda caramelized onions actually speed up the process? Do caramelized shallot taste better on a burger than sweet onions? But to start, I have a bit of a bone to pick, and that is caramelized onions should be called a different name. Let me explain. In order to make caramelized onions, there are two equally important food reactions that need to happen. One, 
is caramelization, as in the name, but secondly is the Maillard reaction. Now we have these broken down on Cookwell, and here's what's important to know. Caramelization is a chemical reaction that requires only sugar molecules, and when exposed to relatively high heat, sugars begin to melt and darken in color. For example, pure sugar melts at around 320 degrees Fahrenheit and then begins rapidly caramelizing around 338 degrees. And this process creates tons of new aromas, which is what gives caramel candies its unique flavor. Secondly, the Maillard reaction is also a chemical reaction, but it requires protein molecules and a free sugar molecule. This reaction also happens rapidly at high temperatures and similarly produces hundreds of new aromas. This is the main reaction that creates the aromas and browned appearance that we love on seared steaks, roasted coffee, and golden brown fried food. Now a question that a lot of people have is, how long does it actually take to caramelize onion? And technically, this is a complicated question because just like you can caramelize sugar to different levels or brown a steak to different amounts, you can Maillard caramelize onions to different levels as well. And here's the test. For this, I chopped up a whole white onion and tossed them in a pan with salt and oil. Then I brought them up to heat and placed them in a 350 degree oven and pulled out the samples at 10 minute intervals all the way up to 60 minutes. The 60 minute onions are deeply brown and roasted, but a little bit of the Maillard reaction and caramelization are beginning to happen at that 20 minute mark. And here's how the Maillard reaction and caramelization change the flavor of onions. From an aroma perspective, hundreds of new aromas are created through the Maillard and caramelization reactions. From a taste perspective, the sugars in the onions are completely broken down and are now easier to be perceived. From a texture perspective, the onions can have a slight bite or be completely soft. From a sight perspective, we can see they go from lightly brown to completely dark. And lastly, we have the human element where what level you may are caramelize your onions is truly a subjective choice. And here's where I pose the question to you, which one do you think will have the most interesting flavor? And I posed a poll to all of you on YouTube and of the 31,000 people who voted, 50% chose the onions that were cooked for 50 minutes. But the number didn't really matter because most of you responded to me with another question. And I think this comment sums it up quite nicely. There's a big difference between what I would use and how long I'm willing to wait. Now, a lot of people joke, myself included, when a recipe says something like, you can caramelize onions in 10 minutes. Because, of course, you can't possibly caramelize onions in just 10 minutes. I mean, it took a solid 50 to 60 minutes for the ones that I did in the oven. But as one final test, I asked myself, well, what level can I cook onions to if I set a timer for just 10 minutes? And this result absolutely shocked me because these look like the 50 to 60 minutes we did in the oven. So first, let me tell you how I did this, but secondly, let me point out some issues with this method. To start, I added oil to the pan over high heat. Now, I let the pan get to 375 degrees Fahrenheit, then I set my 10 minute timer and dropped in a whole white onion that I sliced as thinly as possible because I need the water to evaporate to get the temperatures of the onion above 300 degrees Fahrenheit where the Maillard reaction and caramelization will soon begin to occur. I added a sprinkle of salt and let the onions cook for seven minutes while stirring constantly. You have to be careful in moving them around constantly or else they will get too high a temperature and burn. And as you can see, they are starting to look really brown after just seven minutes, but they are not quite soft and jammy. So I went ahead and added some water for the last three minutes and just kept stirring. So as I'm watching this, I was like, have we been misled for years? From a sight perspective, they look exactly what jammy caramelized onions should look like. And I polled you all and 95% of you assumed these were cooked for at least 30, 50, or 70 minutes. And I even feel bad for the person that left this comment. However, here's the issue. This is why sight, aroma, taste, texture, and physical are all separate concepts that can influence our perception of flavor. By sight alone, you would assume these have the same flavor of the 60 minute onions. However, when I tasted them side by side, I realized there was a couple of differences. Texturally, they are nice and soft, but there's just a hint of bite to them, which again is mostly preference. I don't think 10 minutes is enough time to fully break down the cell walls in the onion, but the bigger issue for me is from an aroma and taste perspective. 
From an aroma perspective, they lack a lot of the complexity compared to the onions that I cooked in the oven for 60 minutes. They predominantly remind me of the aromas from the Maillard reaction, less so caramelization. And because of that, I perceive less sweet flavor. Now the flavor on these onions is still quite good. I mean, for 10 minutes, I would say maybe 80 to 90% is good. And this immediately made me wonder several more questions. First, could I add a little sprinkle of sugar at the six to seven minute mark before I add the water? Two, is that baking soda method even necessary or do they also lack in flavor? And third, what is the optimal amount of time to slowly cook onions? Well, my friends, I'm gonna leave us on a cliffhanger and save those questions for another day. Remember, this is the master's course, not the PhD. But the good news is we're starting a second YouTube channel where we can explore these follow-up videos. It's going to be called Cook Well with Ethan Jabowski, and we'll be making two types of content. First, our recipe videos, and secondly, are these companion follow-up videos to the deep dives where we can test out sugar added versus baking soda added versus 60-minute caramelized onions. And these videos are all gonna be filmed in more of a live laid back format. For example, we just got done filming a lamb pita smash burger and a fresh versus frozen store-bought onion video. So I'll leave a link to that channel below. Those videos won't start coming out until next month. So no worries, I'll post when they actually do go live. So now to conclude this video, let's summarize what we've learned with two questions. First, what is the best onion to keep at home? And secondly, what are the questions you should ask yourself every time you cook with onions? So what is the best onion to keep at home? Obviously, this depends a lot on the human element. Personally, if I could only keep one onion on hand, I would go for the red onion. It's the more pungent variety, which I like for raw application. It looks amazing when it's pickled. Its strong aroma comes through when it's sauteed. However, it's probably not the best for caramelized onions where you want that sweet taste and complex aromas you have created from the Maillard and caramelization reactions. For that use case, I'd probably pick a yellow, white, or sweet onion. Also, this video has made me excited to experiment with shallots in more unconventional ways. They have such a unique top note fragrance that I think will be really good in Mexican rices, pasta sauces, caramelized, or fried crispy. And lastly, here's the summary of the questions that you should ask yourself when cooking onions. First, do I want a strongly concentrated aroma or a milder one? If mild, I'd go for the white, yellow, or sweet onions. If stronger, I'd go for red or the shallot. Or if you want to experiment, there are countless varieties of alliums out there. It's likely not going to make or break the dish. Will I be using these onions raw, sauteed, or caramelized? Remember, the flavor properties of aroma, taste, texture, sight, physical, and human will change substantially. Third, how many onion cells do I want to damage? Or put another way, how much aroma do I want to release? Should I quarter, slice, dice, mince, or ground my onions into a paste? Fourth, is the color of the onion important for the dish? And fifth, how much onion is used for the dish that I'm making? Does it play a supporting role in a simmering sauce, salsa, garnish, or is it the main aromatic like in a French onion soup or caramelized onion pasta? And lastly, I want to challenge you to do at least one onion experiment at home. It's fun and it will make you a better home cook. My goal with these videos is not to tell you what's right or wrong, but I wanna teach you how to think about the fundamentals of cooking. And I'll leave a link to a bunch of different recipes below for you to try out, as well as the fundamentals we have on Cookwell. So this video completely changed how I think about onions, and I hope it does for you too. We use onions all the time in our cooking, but rarely ever think about how they're being used and all the different ways that they can be used. So let me know down in the comments what you end up doing with your onions. Lastly, thank you again to Made In for sponsoring this video and just supporting the channel. Having their support really allows me to take the extra time needed on these deep dives and hopefully deliver a better video for all of you. So if you ever want to pick anything up from them, just head down to the link in the description. But lastly, that will wrap it up for me in this video. This may have been our longest video to date. Our next deep dive may have something to do with the liquid I have in here. But anyway, that will wrap it up for me in this one. I will catch you all in the next one. Peace, y'all.